I'm Bill Jasper with Liberty News Network and the New American Magazine. And I'm in Reno, Nevada at Liberty Pack. And we're fortunate here to have uh, Phil Giraldi, uh, well-known writer, author, commentator uh, for 17 years uh, with the CIA in various places around the world, uh, military intelligence during the Vietnam War in Vietnam. Uh, you write for uh, the American Conservative, for antiwar.com, a uh, number of other publications and websites. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. The, recently, uh, you wrote a column about Rick Perry, governor of Texas, and uh, about his, uh, particularly focusing on his foreign policy and his connection to various neoconservatives from the Bush administration. For those who are not aware of this background or even of the significance of, of these developments, why, what did you find surprising about this? Well, uh, Rick Perry obviously does, has only limited experience as a, as a governor in foreign policy. So he decided at a certain point in his campaign, after he announced his campaign, that he would uh, get some advice from people that he felt were experienced in that area. He went to Donald Rumsfeld, the, the former Secretary of Defense, and asked him to arrange some meetings with people that he thought could give him good advice. And the people that he um, was put in contact with were Doug Feith and William Luthi, who were basically the architects of, of uh, the Iraq failure, the intelligence failure, and also the military failure. And uh, these are the people that are, that are advising uh, Perry, which is, uh, at least to me, somewhat disturbing. They're, they are the ones who are really the architects of much of the Bush-Cheney uh, doctrine and policies of Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, because a lot of these policies sprang out of bad intelligence. And, a lot, and nearly all this bad intelligence came up through the Office of Special Plans, which was supervised by these two gentlemen. And they were using information that was coming from um, sources that were Iraqi dissidents who obviously wanted the United States to attack Iraq and they were making up alarming intelligence reports about, you, you probably recall some of them, about Iraq having these drones that could cross the Atlantic and having chemical weapons, biological weapons and the, the, the Niger uranium forgeries that they were seeking a, a nuclear weapon. These were all lies basically and these were pushed up through the system they got to the White House and they were instrumental in the drive to war in 2002. And so this is really a major revelation about uh, Rick Perry and his relationship to the Bush administration. We already know and conservatives who lined up behind him are beginning to realize that on many other areas of domestic policy as well, uh, on border uh, security, on uh, pro-life issues like the Gardasil vaccine, on spending and other things that he his credentials really don't match uh, the image that's being uh, presented for him. Yeah, he's he's basically I think a guy who has, you know, some some certainly blemishes in his record and he's pretending of course that they're not there. I mean certainly you you could add to that immigration policy as a a serious issue that he talks one way and in fact he's been extremely tolerant of Ill illegal immigrants in Texas. So he, you know, but the foreign policy thing is disturbing particularly because what is, I think many people like myself, believe that what is bankrupting us and what is, is destroying our reputation and what is basically breaking our military uh, is this endless series of wars and it seems that Perry is right on board with that. He has repeated the, uh, the Bush doctrine, you know, saying of, well, we have to fight them over there so that we, we don't have to fight them over here not recognizing that, of course, when you're interfering in other countries, uh, it creates a cycle of, of, of interference in both directions. And uh, the over there keeps expanding. They keep wanting to go over there and over there and over there and over there. Uh, and somehow, in the past decade, this has been, uh, we've seen this transformation where supposedly this is the conservative uh, position to yeah. be in favor of wars all over the world. Now, uh, you don't subscribe to that. Well, I, I think actually if you go back to the uh, pre-Second World War period and you go back to uh, 
uh, even around the Korean War, and you go back to uh, people who were stalwarts of the conservative movement like Robert Taft in the early 1950s, they were very suspicious of, of the military and, and the too powerful military and, and this drive for constant intervention overseas. General Eisenhower was the one who, who coined the expression uh, military-industrial complex to explain what was developing in the United States. So the traditional role of Republicans was to be skeptical about wars and about starting wars. And to also uh, realize, uh, and I think you point this out, that uh, this really uh, detracts from our defensive posture and our ability to defend ourselves by expending all of our uh, uh, armaments all over the world, uh, bankrupting our nation. Yeah, I think, you know, I think anybody who's serious about defense, and, and uh, you know, I'm not a pacifist, I believe that the United States has to have a defense that is capable of defeating any opponent. And I think most Americans would share that view. But the fact is, when you enter into a state of constant war, you're, you're losing the accountability factor in this, where you say, well, who are the people that actually can attack us and do damage to us these days? And those are the people you should be looking at and designing your defense against. But when you're taking on the whole world, essentially you're, you're creating a, a defense establishment which is uh, this gigantic elephant being used to swat a fly. Right. When you have a, uh, when you're fighting terrorists, asymmetric battle with conventional forces occupying whole nations, uh, that is a prescription for failure. Mm -hmm. And it creates more terrorists because if, uh, put it in the American context, if we were being occupied by a foreign country, you'd be a terrorist, I'd be a terrorist. And that, that's just the reality. Uh, people with any national identity whatsoever are going to resent being occupied, even if the occupation is depicted as being friendly. It's just the way things develop, and, and somehow people in the White House don't seem to get this. Uh, are you encouraged? Uh, you've been writing on this for the last several years. Uh, are you encouraged that others are in the intelligentsia, in the policy, uh, areas of both parties are beginning to awaken to this? Well, I, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that we're talking about these things now and that indeed we're having like this interview. In, in A few years ago, it would have been impossible even to broach this subject because people would have said, oh, no, no, we have this terrible terrorist threat, we have this, we have that. I think now people are starting to say, yeah, this is true to a certain extent, but it's being manipulated for political reasons by people in both parties. Well, uh, we appreciate uh, all the work that you've been doing on this, and uh, you, people can read you regularly. At, you have your own website, correct? No, I don't, but I, I do write uh, regularly for Anti-War every Thursday. Antiwar.com. Yeah, for the American Conservative, I write in every magazine issue. I have a, a column called Deep Background, and uh, I also frequently blog for the American Conservative and also write articles and columns for uh, Campaign for Liberty. And that's uh, AmericanConservative.com right. and C4L. C4L is Campaign for Liberty, right. Thank you very much. Pleasure having you here. Thank you very much.